You're listening to Body IO FM with your hosts, Kiefer and Dr. Rocky, where cutting edge science meets the razor's edge of health and performance. Welcome to another edition of Body IO, Body IO FM. Uh, with your host, Kiefer, which is me, and my co-host, Dr. Rocky Patel. Hey, Kiefer. Um, this, believe it or not, has been our like 47th attempt to record this thing. Um, and Rocky said earlier, this was the podcast that was never meant to be, which happens to be the first Q&A podcast on Body IO FM. So apparently somebody does not want me to answer questions out there. Gee, I wonder who that would be, Kiefer. <laughs> So, um, Rocky is um, basically emceeing the questions tonight, Uh, so I'm going to let him ask them, and then we'll just have a discussion about each one. So we did have a lot of uh, Facebook responses, so I'll just start off with, uh, there were several kind of grouped together. Uh, The first set had to do with uh, the resistant starch issue, if there is such a thing as an issue. So (laughs) multiple questions talking about resistant starch possibly blunting insulin spike for desired for backloading. Is that bad? Resistant starch being reasonable as an addition to your ultra-low carb day to keep your blood sugar down during mealtime. Also, how would resistant starch work in the framework of CNS or carb backloading? as well as um, what is the news on resistant starch, eating half a raw potato in the morning when on carbonite or backloading and still staying below 30 carbs throughout the ultra-low carb period. So uh, I'll let you start where you want to start here, Kiefer. <laughs> and I, I think I, got, I know the answer already, but I'll let you tell it. <laughs> uh, I, You know, at the moment, I would say resistant starch is, um, you know, to use one of my patented words apparently is you know another canard right now um you know there there's so much a you know one problem is when i started looking into this is how do we even categorize resistant starch and what is the best way to determine the amount of resistant starch in its fibrous form in any particular food and you'll find values that literally range um 10x across different tables and different charts and different pieces of information and that's because we we really don't even have good tests to test it and some of the experimental tests are showing or you know new testing methods are showing levels that are lower than what we thought and then on top of that we don't actually know uh, what, which bacteria in our body that the resistant starch is feeding and is it appropriate, is it feeding the appropriate, um, bacteria that we want to target for all of these benefits that everybody's claiming. And, you know, there, there's just no research on it. Um, you know, there are research on things that we know feed the right bacteria. For example, because of this research, you know, it's great. I learned about galacto-oligosaccharides and how it's one of the preferred fuels for the most beneficial gut bacteria that we have, not only in helping it to, you know, increase in number, but also to help it colonize. So one problem that a lot of people see when they find out that they've got some sort of derangement or the digestion is messed up, even if we, you know, we supplement with a probiotic that contains the right strains for a person, they may not colonize. Uh, so galacto-oligosaccharides actually are, a, you know, one way to help make sure that we've got the right bacteria, the right bacteria is colonizing, and we feed the right bacteria so that we get the proper B- pH balance in our, you know, colon. Essentially, it's, you know, where this is pretty important. Um, and as an adjunct to a very low-carb type of paradigm like carbonite, galacto-oligosaccharides and maybe a small amount of fructo-oligosaccharides would be what I would recommend to people if they want to make sure that they're actually getting scientific results from this instead of all this, you know, ad hoc N equals one. Oh, I took resistant starch in the form of potato starch and now I feel awesome and this happened and this happened. Um, we, we just don't know all the variables that, that, could have been responsible for whatever it is that people are seeing. So 
Um, to answer the question, you know, the appropriate type of fiber could be used as an adjunct in carbonite, carb backloading. Uh, I think, you know, adding between 10 to 15 grams of galacto-oligosaccharides could have some benefits, uh, particularly for colon health. Uh, and, and, and that's where I would go with it. You know, I could start on this huge rant of we don't even know really the full extent of how the phylum in our colon affects our health. I, you know, it, I think really what it is is we want to keep it as healthy as possible and that helps to keep us as healthy as possible. And it's more of a reflection of if we're healthy and we have a healthy diet, then we have healthy bacteria in our colon. And the flip side of that is, you know, we're just stuck with it. We live in the real world. We're going to have bacteria in our system. And really our health is tied to the health of the bacteria and that if we're eating the right food, we'll have the right bacteria. Not if we do something to try to get the right bacteria, suddenly it's going to make us healthy. Uh, we really don't have any evidence of that. And we have counter evidence where if you put animals in a sterile environment where they have absolutely no bacteria whatsoever in their system, they're healthier and leaner than their peers that are forced to have bacteria. Um, so, you know, I, I think the whole thing is kind of a canard. If you have a healthy diet uh, and you're eating the right foods and you're getting, you know, a lot of the right results, then, you know, the, the bacteria question is just going to take care of itself. Sorry, was that so a long, was say... that too long of a rant? No, I don't think so. I don't know if it was really a rant either, but I guess the question then would be to clarify, would you suggest doing um, galacto-oligosaccharides on a daily basis, on days that you backload, or only on a carb night, or how would you define that? I, You know, again, there's no research, so I can't exactly say when's the most appropriate time to use them, but on carb night, for sure, basically what I would say is whenever you're ingesting carbohydrates— those are the days or those are the times that you should use the galacto-oligosaccharides. So I'll give you my perspective. Uh, I tried potato starch, and I actually worked myself up to four tablespoons a day. I saw absolutely no change in my blood glucose values based on finger sticks. I saw no changes really in how I felt. Uh, so I also actually purchased uh, the galacto-oligosaccharides as well. And I have not been taking it regularly, but I have been doing it on days that I eat carbs, and I have not seen any differences in my blood sugars as well. Over the last two weeks, I actually have been wearing the continuous glucose monitoring device, and there was absolutely no changes in my curves and my sugars. So that's just my N equals one. And I'm not right. saying you shouldn't be taking it, but like you said, I think the research is very, very much in its infancy. And although there are some very compelling initial studies that suggest that maybe this is really something very good for us. Uh, the data just isn't there yet. Uh, but I'm going to continue to play around with it and definitely take uh, my galacto oligosaccharides on carb nights and maybe on days where I just maybe don't feel so great and, you know, do the N1 of experiment, I suppose. Yeah. I, you know, we, we at least have data that it's a really good prebiotic. So, and again, those studies are unfortunately – out of context and by out of context i mean they're on they're in people that are already possibly metabolically deranged or and they're in populations that are eating carbohydrates on a regular basis you know they're eating the wrong foods so all of a sudden we're giving something positive to people who are eating the wrong foods and there might be a benefit and again we don't see huge benefits in any of their blood markers you know where we see the benefit is the bacteria in their colon changes and they, you know, not to be crude, but they have better dumps. So, and, it, and one thing that could be really important is it, it can increase, um, gut motility, which, you know, I think is the real lesson to be learned in any discussion of fiber is, you know, gut motility. I would bet anything. And again, we don't, unfortunately, this isn't researched a lot at the moment, but I would bet that gut motility trumps all these other things we're hearing about with gut health. Okay. Well, let's move on. I think that's enough for resistance starch <laughs> at this point in time. The, the gaseous fumes may become overwhelming at right. one point. So 
we'll right. continue to go here. Um, several questions on leucine, uh, particularly in terms of dosing, uh, timing. If one is to only use leucine post-workout to spike insulin, how many grams to get a big enough spike and to stop the damage from resistance training? Do we need leucine to get mTOR and overall muscle growth stimulation depending on how much muscle we carry? Uh, I know you've talked about the past uh, not backloading carbs after resistance training, but using leucine to create an insulin spike. I know we've talked about, you know, whether you need the carbs or the insulin spike as well. So let me, I'll just kind of leave it open to that. Uh, do you want to give your perspective on it at all? Uh, yeah, I think we were pretty much in agreement that really what you're looking for is you're looking for that insulin spike. Um, certainly there are multiple ways of doing that. Uh, leucine, using leucine is one way to do it without carbohydrates, and sometimes that might have an advantage and it may not. Um, but at least I, from what I've read from your writings, you know, at least five grams is what you need, maybe even more. I'm not sure if you've seen any more recent research on that. Uh, I, I actually haven't been looking into it recently, but you know, I should do that again. F- five grams is you know adequate to raise insulin levels. And again, you know, like you said, we're in agreement. I really think the most important aspect is the insulin spike um, is where you get a really big benefit there. And I'm not going to name names or throw anybody under the bus, but I have had conversations with individuals who are competitive athletes in various realms and they're instead of eating carbohydrates post workout, they're eating very, very low levels of carbs. You know, we're talking 20 grams, which isn't much. And they're injecting insulin uh, to make sure that they get a hot, huge insulin response. And the results essentially mimic carb backloading. Of course, they don't talk about this publicly and they, they shouldn't um, because people could injure themselves. I really do not recommend anybody doing insulin injections. Uh, unless, you know, you're under a doctor's orders or you're type 1 diabetic. But, you know, what we see there in this limited group, it's greater than N equals 1. You know, there are a few people doing this, and they're seeing everything that you would expect with carb backloading. Um, increase in muscle mass and decrease in body fat stores with very, very limited amount of carbohydrates. So it's it's that insulin spike that really seems to be important. So the question is, how high of an insulin spike can you get without carbohydrates? Um, leucine is going to give you a pretty pretty significant spike. If you want to carry that out, you might do five grams post-workout, another five grams that evening. Um, and I actually just had this conversation with um, on another podcast where they had discussed if, for example, they overdid it on one carb night, their next carb night rolled around and they hadn't lost all the weight yet, could they use leucine as an adjunct instead of another carb night? And that would be an appropriate thing to do. So, you know, 5 to 10 grams in a sitting will work fine. If you put that with a protein shake, you're going to get a pretty good insulin response. Uh do we know if the re- response yeah. is different based on the background of metabolic state? So let's say you're doing ultra low carb versus someone who's just eating a regular diet based on carbohydrates. I don't think we have any direct data on that. You know, what what will be, will you get a hyper response, for example, like when the the first time that you have carbohydrates after being ketogenic? So that's a good question. I would imagine you do have a hyper response. It's something, you know, now that I'm here, maybe we should try to look into ourselves as much as possible. And I'd also stress the the deleterious effects of injecting insulin when you're not diabetic. Yes. Ultimately, the worst one being death. So. <laughs> right, right. This is very, very not recommended, uh, you know, to the point of I think some of the people doing it and proposing their own dietary plans – without divulging that information they they actually look a little sick to me in various ways so it's not something that you should be doing or that i would ever recommend you know the only reason i'm halfway glad that they're doing it is it you know is some indirect evidence supporting that it really is the insulin spike is the key factor that we're looking at 
And then kind of to dovetail to that, uh, a question, when doing CNS and focusing on fat loss, we generally try to limit insulin response, but we do use whey and leucine post-workout, but would there be any merit to using MCTs around workout pre and post for the ketone bump to maintain muscle and then skip leucine or whey? Assuming that we're only concerned about fat loss and muscle maintenance. Right. The pre-workout MCT, I don't think is a bad idea. That could be advantageous. It's, it's hard to say. It would be very definitely advantageous for the endurance that you have during your workout. And I don't mean, you know, for marathon running or bicycling. I mean just the efficiency of your cardiac muscle and your diaphragm while you're training. Again, remember, the longer you're ketogenic, the less your muscles will use ketones. It's just a biological fact of all mammals, including humans. Uh, so from that perspective, it's going to help. Uh, ketones, again, we don't know the mechanism by which they do help preserve muscle mass. So we can't say exactly how that's going to work during a training session. I... You know, in, in my opinion, using protein powders is really kind of an adjunct to get more protein into your diet and accelerate muscle muscle accretion, so to speak, or to recover after your workout, not so much for the protein, but for the insulin spike that it could cause. And there's been many times I've recommended to people to do a little bit of protein and a lot of fat post-workout because that just works better for them, works better for their stomach, and their overall protein load is pretty big anyway, so it doesn't seem to make a huge difference. Again, it's that insulin spike we're looking for. MCTs immediately post-workout, you know, I'd be really curious for people to try that with leucine and see what happens, to be honest, because if you can get a ketone spike, that can also raise insulin levels as well. So maybe the combination of the two. Yeah, yeah, that could be a, a good combination. And I haven't had enough individuals lately to experiment with that on because, you know, I've been shifting more into, you know, working with you and trying to help out more normal people instead of more performance-oriented athletes. Sure. Uh, we've talked about this as well in the past uh, individually. What's your take on the Aragon Schoenfeld review of nutrient timing? Their position being that there is no such thing as an anabolic window. I, uh, you know, what's very interesting about their review compared to the meta-analysis that they co-authored is you can tell that the more statistics science oriented person wrote the conclusion of the meta-analysis and, you know, for the review, I, I think, think they were cautious enough um, their ultimate position was not that there's no anabolic window even though that's Alan Aragon's position uh, who pretty much you know his his attitude seems to be absolutely nothing matters so you know I would expect that from him but the overall conclusion of the review was that if there is an anabolic window that it probably extends longer than that, you know, one hour period that we've been taught to believe in, which, you know, I've, I have been kind of on that bandwagon that, you know, it's the amount of protein you ingest. And not only that, the type of protein you ingest, for example, animal sources of protein, long acting uh, types of protein are much better at preserving lean body mass when dieting, which would then lead one to assume that there's a potential that your overall protein load from long-acting proteins would be most beneficial, even for performance. Now, the the meta-analysis they did, I think, again, was a bit of a well-played, well-played way to cast doubt on research when there's still just really no no research or not conclusive research. And for example, what I mean is they very specifically picked an even number of studies that showed some benefit and then no benefit. So what happens when you average that together? The average is, well, we don't know. And that was really the only conclusion of their meta-analysis. And instead of proposing studies that could be done to actually answer this question, they just ended with, I don't know. Um, 
and, and you know, I feel that was a disservice. You know, it, rather than a meta analysis, what they should have possibly done is reviewed methods to actually answer this question instead of just basically pandering to their own prejudices, which is what the whole exercise came down to when you read it. You know, I think they did a good job of collecting the research. You know, I think they made some valid points, but the points really are only that the research isn't good enough to answer the question. So, you know, and some of it's not in context. For example, you've got studies that compare something like whey hydrolysates immediately post-training with no other protein source. And then that's compared to where the person had casein protein immediately post-workout. And you saw either equal or greater protein accretion in the body with the casein case. Well, we know that's possible because pro, you know hydrolysates without some compensatory protein can cause a refractory imbalance in amino acids. You get a big spike and then you get a big lull. So, you know, comparing those two instances is not a fair comparison of what might happen in the body. So, you know, I, I think the whole thing was an exercise in futility. Just, you know, it was a nice feather to put in their cap. Uh, I think it was well written. It was a nice review of the literature. The meta-analysis, in my opinion, was pretty much you know, only good at saying, well, if you want to grow muscle, then you need to eat more protein, which everybody's in agreement on, which is the best they could have done with the research that's out there. And what I would have liked to have seen is for them to talk about, okay, what we would really need to do to answer this question is to do some radioactive marker studies on the recently ingested protein and look at see where it's accreted, which would take muscle biopsies. It would be, you know, some exp expensive research but it would help us to answer the question conclusively. So in my mind, really, it was just, like I said, an exercise in futility. And I'm sure Alan Aragon feels great about having that published research. I mean, I would. Well, I, I would let you be the test subject in that study. You would? You'd let me do the biopsies? I, 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 well, I'd let you be the biopsy. I, I would, of course, be doing the biopsy. Right, right. You'd be yeah. the person getting it. Yeah, I don't mind. I'd let you be the test subject. Yeah, I don't mind like having some radioactive protein. That's fine with me. No. I don't think that would bother me, but it would be more the, the actual sticking the needle in the muscle bed. Yeah, so. I've heard about how that feels, and uh, I heard about like the the punch biopsy, and then the kind of grinding around to make sure they break it loose from the the uh, connective tissue at the bottom. I just can't imagine that that feels good. <laughs> All right, let's move on here. Did, I did have you have any commentary question. on that? You know, you can. No, I mean, I, 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 I think we talked about this as well uh, offline, and we're pretty much in agreement. I mean, I think uh, you, you have uh, several studies that can be positive, several studies that are negative, some in the middle. They tend to cancel each other out. So you really, you were kind of almost in a way have set the question up without with knowing what the answer is going to be, and you're you're framing the argument so it supports your theory. Um, and and in general, though, I think like you said, the the duh moment is of course if you eat more protein. You'll you'll probably do better, <laughs> right? But they didn't really. It, it, they're not really. Again, it was not designed to look at specific sources and types. They kind of lumped it all into one, and so. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of key, again. It, go ahead. Oh, I just you know it's a, a much more complex issue than just saying okay, let's just put these all together and 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 a lot of times that's the case with meta analysis as well. So uh, you always have to take meta analysis with a grain of salt as well, just because of that factor. It's not actually a real study per se. Yeah. Like I said, I, I think the real value there is that they very much opened up the question and cast a doubt, which is always important in this field. You know, we don't know. That's what came out of all of this. We don't know, and that should open up a lot of avenues for study. Okay, we don't know if protein immediately at post-training is going to help. Uh, maybe we don't know what type. Maybe we don't know the right combination. You know, there's there's so many things that could be explored there. And maybe just looking at hyd hydrolysates post-training would be a problem. You know, maybe that could limit results even. You know, we're just not sure. So, you know, what I would like to see come out of that is like future research to help actually answer these questions instead of what I would consider not like half-assed, but really basic studies that were done. Okay, we're just going to use this type of protein. We're going to use this type of protein. And let's just see what happens at the end of it. Right. 
All right. Uh, next question. Uh, I'll try to do, pick some individual questions here. So I'm 24% body fat down from 31% since starting carb night nine months ago. I've also gained an additional 4% lean body mass during the time. I'm lifting heavy and currently training 531 using a four day split. After carb night, I'm quite strong for a couple of days, but get noticeably weaker on my lifts as my ultra low carb weeks go on. I still need to primarily focus on getting leaner, and I'm not lean enough yet to switch to carb backloading protocol. I do take a post workout shake away in creatine, and once a week prior to carb night, I had leucine and dextrose. My question is would I help or hurt myself if I begin to incorporate some additional post workout nutrition within a two hour time frame of T glute translocation during a few of my ultra low carb days? Maybe something like 50 grams of carbs more or less, dextrose versus real foods. Thank you. Well, the question is, what are what are we really looking at here? What's the goal? The goal is fat loss, and they're training 531, and they're gassing out. Well, that would tell you that maybe 531 is not the appropriate training paradigm. Rather than, okay, how should I then alter my diet so that I can continue to do this workout? You know, you, you've got to tune everything to your goals. My response would be, well, when you start to gas out or... You, you've already got this great amount of information in front of you and that's that by just say Tuesday or Wednesday, I don't know what day, but I start gassing out. Well, go into your workouts of those days and trim back the workload. You know, there's no reason that if you're not eating carbohydrates that you should be training at the same volume. And we have a podcast, we, we are actually recording these out of sync, but we had a great conversation with Ben Greenfield and ultimately what we kind of looked at when we discussed him and it probably holds true with resistance training is that when you're not eating carbohydrates your training volume should only be 40 percent of what it is while you are on carbohydrates so that means 531 is a totally inappropriate training volume paradigm for you while you're low carbing it so you need to figure that out and it sounds like you've already got all the information you need to figure it out so instead of trying to introduce carbohydrates just so that you can stick exactly to the 531 template, modify the 531 template to match your diet, and I absolutely guarantee you, you will see better results from your training. And there was a similar question. If someone is doing CNS and not following Shockwave, would there be a maximum recommendation on frequency and or volume of training? So I guess that would kind of dovetail into that. That would answer some of that question as well. Yeah. Uh, again, your volume is going to be much lower. Like I said, it doesn't have to be shockwave. That's uh, can, can be very low volume. What the best thing to do is, you know, and maybe that's a good example. You pick a training paradigm and start to feel when you gas out. And you know that happens on Wednesday and you know you just don't have the energy to make it through the workout all the way. We'll start trimming the workout back. Um, a great tool to use during this would be Joel Jameson's HRV, uh, BioForce HRV, it, you know, it could literally help to tell you, okay, you're not, you're on carb night, you're not eating these carbohydrates, and on Wednesday, not only do you feel yourself gassing out, but your HRV goes red. So that tells you that you tried to force too great of a training volume without the appropriate nutritional support. So you need to ratchet back your, your training volume. It will not, I absolutely guarantee you, it will not affect the results of your training Odds are you'll get better results faster. Okay. Uh, next set of questions. <laughs> <You're> I'm <laughs> just going to – we got like three pages of stuff here, so I'm just going to okay. try to squeeze as much as I can. Or I'll, I'll probably get angry Facebook messages. So <laughs> you don't have to worry about that though. That's uh, true. So <laughs> – Several questions regarding women in training and, and carb backloading and carb nights. So I'm going to throw a couple of these out here. Uh, is there a baseline for women to follow while on carb backloading? The book seems geared for men, but should women have some exceptions, certain aspects of the diet? When training, should women stay heavy generally, even if not following shockwave or heavy-duty training programs? Uh, another one, what is the best guideline for macronutrients for women or equations to find out for pure fat loss on CNS? Only reason I ask is because the answers I keep getting are changing. I want to know what the latest and greatest is. This is ultra-low carb on the actual carb night. So the couple of questions regarding women training, and I know we just did the podcast with AJ, but I thought I'd just kind of shoot those off as well. Yeah, I, I would almost just refer back to that podcast with AJ. I mean, part of the problem is it's so heavily 
individual dependent. Um, another problem is women are much more sensitive to stress responses and higher stress responses mean that they're going to have less access to their intramuscular glycogen stores. And if that's the case, you know, I don't care how much you would have to beat yourself to death in training just to start to access those glycogen stores, you know, AKA CrossFit, but then the repercussions of that are an even greater stress response that are just going to beat you up as you go. So, you know, it's a carb backloading for women is a very, very in-depth topic. And there is a book slated on that finally now that everything, the dust has settled from dangerouslyhardcore.com getting stolen from me and, you know, all of that evaporating. You know, a lot of these things are back on track now. And, I, you know, until car backloading for women is out, I wouldn't really trust too many opinions out there. Uh, and or AJ's, you know, had a lot of experience with it and she talks to me weekly her opinion I would trust and because mostly it's not opinion anymore. She has a lot of empirical information and I've been able to help guide some of that with science as well. Uh, other than that, I stick with carbonite. When you, you know, if you're already as lean as you want to be, then, you know, when you gas out, that's when you know you need to eat carbs that night. You know, it's really that simple. It doesn't have to be this super complex, I need an equation. Uh, most of the time, the equation is not going to be appropriate for you. And I would assume that would be start with some modified or some X amount of carbs and then track and see how things go. And then you can adjust up or down depending on how things are going on the scale or the mirror or the body yeah. mass, uh, body fat testing that you're doing. Yeah, you, you know how I always am about that just because I feel like tracking it sometimes is somewhat of a detriment I mean, literally, when you, for myself, this is an equals one, and for a lot of people who have the most success that I know personally, it always comes down to, oh, I'm feeling really drained. I'm either going to eat some carbohydrates because I'm feeling really drained, or I'm going to change my training so that I don't feel really drained anymore. So as we, I talk to patients about not focusing on minutia, looking at that 50,000 foot level, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it's, you know, people just, because there's so much science justifying why to do these things, people just assume that they must take, like, such minute care of constructing every single piece of their diet. And, you know, literally, I'm not going to do that for somebody unless it's the final weeks going on stage. Because then it matters. Then there's a lot of tricks you can do for a lot of aesthetic things on stage. But, you know, you just don't need to be at that detail in everyday life. Another topic we've spoken with, uh, uh, spoken to each other about offline, um, is fructose. So, what are your thoughts on fructose during carb backloading and carb night, including fructose from sucrose, fruit, and just fructose added into items on the shelf? Should we try and avoid at all costs? Everything in moderation. Don't worry about it. I'm asking about this in two areas, since sometimes sometimes they differ: health, nutrition being the goal, or fat loss, muscle gain being the goal. I have, an, I have a good idea where I stand on the subject, but I'm curious about Kiefer's recent findings since I last heard uh, heard about it was about two years ago on the Q&A with Sean Heisen. And I know you mentioned it on your recent podcast that you did with uh, Road to Ripped. Oh, yeah. That was my added comment. Oh, that, that was your added comment. Yes. Did you did you want to make any commentary uh, first? Well, I think that definitely... I, things that I've been seeing with my continuous glucose monitoring device is that I know that if I do cleaner carbs, my glucose profiles are better. And so I, I've gone back to where I tend to do a lot Wait, of... Let's, rice. let's define cleaner carbs. That's what I was going to get to here. Oh, okay. So I was going to say, what I, what I tend to usually do now is I really tend to really hammer some of the starches. Uh, I do rice, sweet potato, white potato. Uh, so I try to do those early. And I find that, and and by by vicariously by doing that, I'm not eating a lot of the more junkier, crappier carbs that I have more processed. Mm -hmm. And I, I found that my recovery in terms of blood glucose day one or day two post carb night uh, is significantly better. And I think you had hinted at this on that podcast that you know the more processed, uh, higher fructose containing foods that you eat, the quicker you're probably gonna 
fill up your liver stores of glycogen. Yep. And exactly. then, and then, and then it's going to be trying to dump that stuff out of your liver over the next two or three days as you go back to low carb that maybe may inhibit some of the things that you're actually looking for. Right. Exactly. I think, you know, if you've been extremely strict on carb night, well, let's just say in general, limiting fructose is going to have one huge advantage and that's that it turns out that ingested glucose or you know or starches like potato and rice that are going to release glucose pretty rapidly have a very very hard time replenishing liver glycogen stores uh it's very interesting their their preferred area of disposal is going to be muscle tissue and you know one great thing about once glucose uh recompensates intramuscular glycogen stores the glycogen can't get back out it can no longer supplement blood glucose levels and that's because muscle lacks uh, glucose 6 phosphatase so it, it it can't release that glycogen back into the bloodstream whereas the liver when it's recomped then it can release that glycogen to replenish blood level blood glucose levels and fructose, on the other hand, has this amazing ability to recompensate liver glycogen levels. And that's because it's not limited in the uh, first couple of steps as it moves into byproducts, the same end byproducts as gly- glucose would. There's no limitation there. So fructose can quickly refill liver glycogen stores. So if you are having trouble losing or if you are having trouble losing body fat on carbonate, Sticking with those cleaner carbohydrate sources will make a difference. Uh, if you're training on carb backloading, it starts to make a big difference because what you want to do is ensure that you are replenishing your intramuscular glycogen stores while trying to limit as much as possible your liver glycogen stores. And that's where you see people that are eating mashed potatoes and pizzas and things like that are actually do really well on carb backloading because you don't have a high fructose component there. So maybe adding some dextrose to my rice, sweet potato mash, or maybe having some Wonka pixie sticks is the way to go since those are all mostly dextrose based and has little or no fructose. Yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, Let's see here. What else can can I just add a side note? That's why it makes diets that talk about, Basically, intermittent fasting with a ton of fruit at night, as much fruit as you can eat or want to eat, kind of show the ignorance of the authors. You know, they're not out there doing any kind of research. Um, They're not trying to understand how the body works. They're just throwing stuff together and, you know, really, I I think, doing a disservice. You know, they just think, oh, this is great. You know, intermittent fasting with a bunch of fruit and fruit's healthy. Awesome. Awesome. You know, it, it's really not, it's not that awesome. I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Do we want to deplete muscle glycogen too when on CNS or only liver glycogen? And do we need a hit to deplete liver glycogen or can we just go minimum five days under 30 grams of carbs and expect our liver glycogen to be depleted? Uh, I'm going to say this varies case by case. Uh, if you are staying ultra low carb, you should be able to deplete liver glycogen stores. Like I said, for most people, liver glycogen stores are pretty well depleted within four to five days. And that's most people. We, we don't always see that. And if you are extremely overweight, we've got a complicating factor. And that's that as you deplete gly- liver glycogen stores and you've kept your insulin levels lower you are actually starting to release triglycerides from your fat stores, which is going to increase glycerol flux from your fat, your body fat, which can then help to recompensate glycogen stores and can also be recycled into blood sugar. So we, you know, what I would really be concerned with there is just keeping insulin levels as low as possible. Uh, Even possibly getting into ketosis is not not going to be viable for everybody and we've actually seen that people have been reporting like oh no matter what i do i can't get into ketosis 
And, you know, the, the problem really there might be that there's just this glycerol flux that's helping to recomp that or possibly something's going on in the liver to hold on to those glycogen stores, which I can't explain. But even if it is, you should be pretty, pretty low insulin most of the time. So I, I would say you're not concerned about wiping out intramuscular glycogen stores, not very critical. The only reason that would be critical is if you want to eat a lot of carbohydrates. If you want to eat a lot of carbohydrates and do the least amount of damage, then yes, you want to deplete intramuscular glycogen stores as much as possible so that the carbs you do eat have some place to go. Uh, otherwise, really what you need to focus on is wiping out your liver glycogen stores, which should happen naturally. You should, HIT is not necessarily going to do that. Uh, your best bet is actually just not eating carbohydrates or skipping breakfast because glucagon levels can go up. And even though glucagon in certain scenarios will help to convert amino acids or lean tissue into glucose through gluconeogenesis, glucagon's main function is actually to break down glycogen in the liver to get it out to be used for energy. So uh, again, it shouldn't be you don't have to do any crazy tricks. You don't have to do hit. You, really what you need to do is just be smart about your food choices, which is what carb night's all about. Okay. Yeah, no uh, comments on question. that? Because you like to do a lot of the, you do the the continuous glucose monitor quite a bit. So. Yeah, I, I wear, I've worn it for the last 10 days. And I know at least from my own finger sticks, typically by day four, day five, my fasting sugars are below 90. So I'm going to take that as a sign that, you know, depending on what my carb night's like, it usually takes four or five days before I'm back down into that level. And I'm going to take that as a sign that potentially that my liver glycogen is coming down. Uh, that's the only thing I can think of. Yeah. Obviously, there's no way to really test for it, but it would make sense from a, from a metabolic and physiologic standpoint. Um, and certainly I know when I do either lower amount of carbs or cleaner carbs, uh, that will happen faster. Yeah. So, so you could do a liver biopsy, couldn't you? We could certainly do liver biopsies. Uh, you can do them percutaneously as an outpatient in the hospital. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not sure who's going to volunteer for that study. <laughs> so, all right, uh, fair enough. But we could. We I, I, maybe we'll find some people who'd want to volunteer. I don't know. It's always <laughs> possible. Uh, two questions on nicotine. Uh, I will say that I do not contone nicotine use in any patients, and I will not say that I would recommend it, but people are asking about it, so I'll throw these out here. A couple on nicotine sources. So could you use an e-cigarette or inhaler for nicotine ingestion instead of gum? Uh, another question was, where did it go? Long, awkward silence. I'm just trying to fill the Suggest, uh, oh, there we In go. the nicotine protocol, Kiefer suggests taking two milligrams in the morning and four milligrams in the afternoon, strength accumulation, carboclinine. Just wondered why this is the case, as I assume that you would have wanted it the other way around. And what would make this valid in terms of the amount of carbs taken that night, for example, taking less than 250 grams of carbs? So a couple of questions regarding uh, source of nicotine and how you get it in your system, and then uh, in a specific situation with carboclinine. I think any way you can get it in is kind of ideal. You know, the gum works really well. Uh, again, if you're just chewing the gum, you're not getting as much as you think. You're supposed to chew it a little bit and then stick it in your cheek. Uh, between the between your your gums and your cheek, that'll help the absorption there. I, I would assume the inhalers, you know, I know some of the nicotine inhalers have 10 milligram cartridges, and if you use them as you're supposed to, you'll get four milligrams of absorption. So that's about the, you know, the, I'm going to guess the 40% mark is what you're looking at for any kind of inhaler or e-cigarettes. Uh, as far as which, which of those is best, I, I don't know for sure. And that's hard to say. When it comes to... I, I can't remember, is, is that from the article or the book? I actually don't remember because I it thought I had It sounds like it's from the book. I think it's from the Nicotine Protocol. Hmm. I wonder if I screwed it up in the book. Or, or basically the nicotine was to, you know, help decrease. So, you know, one thing nicotine can do is help um, with insulin insensitivity. 
but if you're using it post training you've got glute 4 translocation in your muscles anyway so what you're really doing is preventing fat cells from being able to store or get access to any of those carbohydrates to then form triglycerides and store body fat so that would be the if you're eating them with carbs again you need to be very careful with your recommendations they're very very important to keep in context that this is for people who are exercising for a very particular reason they're athletes in general you don't want to be taking carbohydrates with nicotine because of like i just said it it causes a state of potential insulin resistance which is going to have bad consequences if you're eating carbohydrates again if you're training and you're training heavy and if you have to ask what heavy is that means you're probably not training heavy so if you are training heavy then nicotine use after working out with a carbohydrate load could be advantageous did i cover enough bases there for you rocky i think so okay I mean, I think uh, the main. I think one of the main things to keep in mind is the really stressing the importance of not having carbohydrates with it. I mean, right. That would be the biggest thing. And if you're on the, if you're following one of the protocols, you're following one of the protocols. You're not going to half-ass it basically, and then say, okay, I'm going to throw this on top of it because I'm not getting the results and see what happens. Right. So. Exactly. Uh, I'll let you answer this question initially, and then maybe I'll take over. Uh, I've seen uh, personally. I've seen questions on the forums regarding diabetes and diabetics who want to do CNS. Mm -hmm. So, for prescribing CNS for a diabetic folks, what are some things we should look for, like medical documents, numbers, insulin medications, things that I would suggest in looking patients, along with proper macros and food choices, both ultra low carb and carb night. Uh, with the recent discussion of uh, so we'll start with that. So I'll I'll let you take kind of the macro food choices, and then I'll take over some of the other questions there in that question. Well, yeah, during the week, it's obvious. It's just really low carb, you know, that your food choices are just like they would be for anybody else. Your food choices on carb night, that is going to vary. Again, cleaner starches could be advantageous. Again, I'm going to assume this person is just not weight training. So what you what you want to look at are potentially cleaner sources of carbohydrates of maybe a small spike again the the window here is going to be important if i were working with a diabetic i would actually have a little bit of a spike early in an attempt to get past that uh, refractory insulin insensitivity um but again there there's some there's a lot of unknowns there you know we don't know Will the insulin spike alone give all the beneficial horm hormonal responses that we're looking for? If that's the case, that would change my recommendations. So in general, the clean carbs with one potential spike later in the evening right before bed. And by spike, okay. that, that could be like Fruity Pebbles or something or a, even a Pop-Tart. So I'll add in, you know, when I see diabetics in the office and they're motivated. So I this is something I reserve only for the motivated patient because if you have an, a patient who's not motivated uh, and not willing to self-monitor on a regular and a frequent basis, it can be a recipe for disaster. So uh, ultimately, any diabetic who wants to do carb night, definitely work with their physician or their healthcare provider. And if you don't have one that was willing to work with you, find another one. So that would be the first recommendation. And second recommendation, it really depends on the medications that they're on. So if they're on any medicines that will cause hypoglycemia, that has to be really monitored closely. So if they're on a sulfonylurea, if they're on insulin, uh, these are two medicines that can uh, cause low blood sugar reactions, especially as you take carbs away. Um, that has to be monitored a lot of times depending on what the starting point is. So if, there's, if they're a fairly uncontrolled diabetic, I will usually l cut their medication by 20 to 30 percent initially just to prevent any type of hypoglycemic reaction. If they're um, fairly well controlled or close to their goal, then uh, I will probably just remove those medications so that we can avoid the hypoglycemia. I'd rather have them have a little bit higher blood sugar than crashing and ending up in a diabetic coma. So that's the first thing. The second thing, I tend to use medications that do not use hype that does not cause hypoglycemia. And a lot of times, I actually may actually add a medicine 
just to cover our bases if I'm taking something away, uh, to make sure that the blood sugar is well controlled. I really have them wanting them to test your sugar at least three to four times a day. A lot of diabetics check, check just in the morning. So again, they have to be motivated and be willing to do the finger sticks because I want the data to see how they're reacting to different scenarios and different situations. I agree with the clean carb um, scenario with the carb night. And I think that what you said earlier about uh, the pizzas and the pastas and, and those type of foods are the way to go. So typically what I will have them do is do a modified carb night basically. So I will have them do six and a half days of ultra low carb. And then on their carb night, I let them have a meal of their choice and then near bedtime, a dessert of their choice. And we start there and then we look at response and go from there. So it's not going to be an all out free for all. Uh, it's going to be kind of more mitigated. And then from there, we'll go from there. And obviously, that's going to change depending on the situation. So a patient coming in with a blood sugar of 300 is going to be completely different than someone who comes in and their their fastings are 110 and their after meal sugars are 150. So those are some things that we do in the, in the office here as well. Uh, but again, it really is important, and I can't stress this enough, that, that these patients do not go out on their own and do it. They really should work with a healthcare provider so that someone is managing them and following them. Uh, and, and like I said, the biggest fear for me for these patients would be hypoglycemia. The other last thing I'll add in is depending on the type of work they're doing, what their workouts are like, this can also be an issue. So we work with a lot of first responders and certainly taking a first responder down to 30 grams of carbs six and a half days a week is just not going to work for them for their job on certain occasions. So you have to keep that in mind as well. And like you said, you know, how are you feeling? If you're feeling fatigued and, you know, lethargic and, you know, and the workouts aren't going well, that should be telling you something. So, see, I, I'm, st I still think the first responders could function appropriately and at an accelerated level without carbs. I just think the monitoring and the adherence there has been been too poor. I would agree with that. Yeah, because Plus, you know, you, you also have a population that maybe thinks that you, know, you ha if a little is good, more is better. Right. So. You know, so if lo ultra low carb, if 30 grams of carbs is good, then I'm going to go to zero because that's better and I can do it and do it better than everybody else. Yeah. And uh, you, you may have that mentality. And I think the problem is they, they don't pick up the fat load. You that's know, that's the other issue. Yeah. Without that massive fat load to compensate, you know, where are they getting their energy? Their mitochondrial density is not going to go up. Uh, you know, they, they're they basically just in this stalled state of constant starvation. So, of course, they're, you know, they're going to be performing like crap i mean they've their body has no choice and that's it's an interesting population because they've seen what high fat you know american diets do to people and so i would imagine that's deeply ingrained in their psyche how important it is not to eat fat right do and think? i think you're almost alluding to the i think peter t has deemed it the zone of misery mm -hmm. you know where you're not getting enough fat you're eating too much protein right keeping you from from making the energy that you need yeah so uh let's see here what else do we have we're coming on almost an hour yeah we're like 53 Anything, minutes it, yeah any other rants that you want to go off on uh i don't think i have anything today <laughs> oh let's see here unusual silences i heard Kiefer state in a podcast that high triglyceride levels in the blood is a big risk for a heart attack. Why then is it acceptable to consume high fat meals during carb night and carb backloading? Are the triglycerides metabolized into ketones and fatty acids or digested in a manner that reduces the risk of a heart attack? Well, it's a risk factor. So this is what we're looking at is a risk factor in general population who is eating these things at night. Um, so the, the correlation there is we're getting, you know, possibly a large postprandial triglyceride load after we eat a meal that, that could be fatty. Uh, again, there's some question marks there because the carbohydrates are going to be into your system pretty quickly. The fats are going to get in much later. Uh, we will have some fatty acid flux from the intestinal tract from earlier in the day. Uh, the question is, how does this correlate with this type of diet? And there's no answer to that. Um, what we see in sick populations and in diabetic populations is that when their triglyceride levels are elevated throughout the day, that's, that's a steep increase 
in heart attack risk. Um, what it does in this diet, I, I can't say for sure. Uh, we've got blood work that shows that these diets just improve blood work, period. And I would assume that being in a very advantageous, healthy blood lipid profile for 80% of your day and deviating for maybe, you know, one, that other 20% or less probably has no deleterious effects, especially if you're exercising, which is really the only time you should be using carb backloading. Carb night, it's even much, much less. You're talking about 98% of your week is in an optimum blood profile and you've just got one night that you're worried about. So again, I can't answer that question from a pure scientific standpoint. I can only put it in perspective and look at how health is changing in people who are using these programs and every factor you would want to look at is improving. So I'll add in that we know certainly for sure that having a post meal lipemia or high triglycerides after a meal is certainly a risk factor for cardiovascular disease and events. We usually see this in more, for lack of a better term, metabolically damaged patients. So patients who are on the road to diabetes, they're insulin resistant, pre-diabetic or diabetic. That is the more common scenario where we see that. And so that's probably why you, why you see that risk. And those patients certainly are at much higher risk because of their disease state. I think that if you have a patient who is not diabetic, who's not insulin resistant, following these protocols, like you say, even though we don't have the scientific studies, we could potentially extrapolate. We know if we look at studies that Volk has done in patients doing high fat diets, you look at every single marker, biomarker of health, they improve. HSCRP gets better, LDL gets better, HDL goes up, triglycerides go down, all your inflammatory cytokines improve. So uh, I think that that you can kind of extrapolate a little bit, but like you said, we don't really have the scientific data. I'll tell you, at least from my own blood draws, which I do quite frequently, uh, I have drawn my blood the day before a carb night, the day after a carb night, two days after a carb night. My fasting triglyceride level doesn't vary or does not vary very greatly. So it's, it's it's typically usually always below 80. So I can give you that my two cents in that respect. So there we go. Um, Do we have anything else Anna, interesting? I am I'm looking through. Um, well, we're at like 57 minutes and we've covered a lot of topics. Yeah, I think so. I tried to pick a little bit of everything out of here. I'm good to go if you're really good to go. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, that I, I think it was a good Q and A session. I, it's definitely yeah. one of the more in depth ones I've done. You know, most of the stuff I usually know. seems like fluff from people who just didn't read the books. Well, I tried to kind of weed that stuff out. <laughs> yeah, it's like so. Basically, if if you submitted a question on Facebook that we didn't touch, that probably means you should actually go read the books. Um, you know, that happens a lot. People just. Even if they buy the book, sometimes they don't crack it open. I don't know how many times I've heard that from people. Oh, well, I bought the book, but I haven't opened it yet. Can you just tell me what to do? It's like, that's why I wrote the book so that you can know what to do because I don't have the time to tell everybody what to do all the time. So, you know, the, the books are there to answer a lot of the basic questions. Don't try to overcomplicate it. Uh, if you've got the basics nailed, you're going to do very well. Granted, Carb Night is out of date and that needs to be updated. That's one of the reasons for these podcasts is to try to keep people informed of you know the way to modify them as we learn new, new science and have experience using them in more and more people. Uh, so don't so don't just you know ask the really mundane questions. Read the book. It's going to give you a great foundation. And then you will have some really good questions that not only will help you, it's going to help everybody in the audience. So I, you know, I highly recommend reading those books if you have them. I'm not saying go buy them. If you don't buy into it, that's fine. But I'm also not going to tell you how to do the diet. Uh, but by the same same token, those who've read the book have asked some really great questions, and this show is an example of that. You can tell these people have been around for a while. Uh, I've read read things on the website have read the ebooks and uh, you know it makes for great questions and actually will lead me in new directions of things to look up uh, on the ones that I'm not as sure about as I'd like to be 
So uh, one more last question here. Any oh. update for the peeps regarding body IO, car backloading 2.0? I know there's a lot of itching at the, at the, at the cuffs here. Uh, where are we with everything? Uh, I'm only going to say the things I know for sure, and I know body IO is pretty close to up, and my guess is if you're listening to this podcast, that body IO is up and active. So body.io is basically the new home for everything, and that's going to evolve over this year into what will be close to its final form probably at least by the end of this year, um, but it will be an evolving process. I just want to get the get a new home up essentially is what's going on. And uh, like I said, by the time you're listening to this podcast, that new home will be up. And I'm not going to comment on anything else because I don't know exact dates. And I've realized how much of a disaster that is to speculate. I thought I'd just give you a chance, you know. Thanks. Maybe you had some new information that you didn't tell me about. No, no. You you are pretty much abreast of everything. All right. Well, cool. Well, this is great. Hopefully, maybe we can come back in uh, a short period of time and do another Q&A and hopefully uh, spur on some more questions and maybe take the discussion to a different uh, level. So. Yeah, I think next time we should try to get questions on Paleo. Because we're going to okay. be coming up on Paleo FX pretty soon. Oh, that'd be a good idea. Yeah, it'd be good to stir the pot before I actually get there. Okay. Great. All right. All right. I'll talk to you later. All right. Uh, this is Body IO FM, and we will talk to you next time. been listening to Body IO FM with your hosts, Kiefer and Dr. Rocky. If you'd like to hear more, log on to body.io. We'll be back next time with more science from the pinnacle of human health and performance.